Much of the interest uh, in the ethics of trust has concerned things like the ethical responsibility to be trustworthy or to improve conditions, social conditions for trustworthiness and so on. But I want to consider the slightly less theorized issue of the ethical responsibility to trust or to distrust. Even if our goal, and, and it is one of Peretier's stated objects, uh, objectives, is to establish social conditions in which people end up trusting trustworthy sources, one may get a better sense, I argue, of these conditions by treating the people who, are, who we want to be trusting appropriately as moral agents, agents who are trusting or not trusting, to what they take to be moral imperatives, in response to what they take to be moral imperatives, not merely psychological ones. So in a sense, I'm sort of pushing back against the psychologizing of the, of the conversation, especially when we're talking about the ethics of trust. This means that we treat people who distrust respectable, reputable journalists and scientific experts, and instead perhaps trust populist politicians and uh, conspiracy theories, we must treat them as rational agents responding to genuinely ethical perspectives and not as psychologically twisted or lacking fully autonomous agency or full rationality. And it enables us to see people from their own point of view with empathy and to engage with their perspective. And the advantage of this approach is not just that it's more respectful and humble, but also that it opens up the possibility of genuine dialogue with the people we're actually concerned to, to change. And that there is an ethical and not merely psychological issue about whether to trust may be seen by considering the two sorts of betrayal introduced in that famous article that Thomas mentioned by Judith Baker back in 1987. In a relationship of friendship with someone, you, you may betray that friendship by failing to do what you've committed to do as part of that friendship, for example, by lying to your friend. But there's also a second kind of betrayal that's possible that the questioner um, mentioned. That's by failing to believe what your friend tells you. In the second case, you betray the friendship by failing to trust your friend. Now, Judith Baker introduces the possibility of describing someone who's reluctant to trust as overly suspicious and misanthropic. And if she's right about this, then trusting within friendship is an aspect of virtue. It's what good friends do. And she develops the idea that real friendship requires trust, even in the face of counter-evidence. For example, if your friend is accused of being a spy, but she tells you that she isn't, you're under an obligation of friendship to trust her and presume her innocence for longer than the evidence by itself suggests. Now, this claim may be controversial, is controversial. But what seems clear is that friendship involves certain ethical responsibilities. These will depend on the nature of the friendship, but they generally involve what might loosely be described as being there for your friend. For example, if the friend's in need, you should be there for your friend in advance of the general ethical requirement of a stranger to be there for someone in need. What Baker's example relies on is the fact that sometimes what you need is for your friend to trust you. Being there for your friend is to trust them. And your status as a friend means that you're under an ethical obligation to meet this need, ahead of the general obligation of, that a stranger, that might apply to a stranger. The obligation to trust that applies to a stranger does not outrun the evidence, according to Baker, but the obligation to trust that applies to a friend may do so. In fact, later on, I'm going to argue that the obligation to trust strangers also may outrun the evidence, but I'll come back to that in a minute. To dig further into this, it's necessary to introduce a theoretical structure for thinking about trust in general. Roughly speaking, there are two main theoretical approaches. Um, one that, that takes the attitude of one person trusting another to be basic, the attitude to be basic. Um, to use Thomas's terms in the Q&A, this would be described as a two-place relation, A trusts B. Um, and the other one takes the behavior of one person acting 
with trust, with respect to another person's behavior as basic. For the purposes of this talk, I will take the second approach with no further argument. So this is what Thomas described as a three-place relation. A trusts B to do X. And in fact, I think um, it's more helpful to think of this as a four-place relation. A, in doing X, trusts B to do Y. So there are essentially four variables in the relation of trust. If trust is understood, if the basic conception of trust is understood to be that one of, if you like, the behavioral thing, trusting someone in doing something. OK, what's key to this uh, relation is the idea of reliance, as Thomas mentioned. Um, a, in doing X, is doing something with a goal that requires B to be doing their thing, Y. And an extra condition that's essential to this four-place relation, but isn't always brought out in the philosophical analysis, is that what A is doing um, and what they're relying on B to be doing are part of the same plan or enterprise. The behavior that trust belongs to is collaboration. If A is trusting B, then they're doing something as part of a collaborative enterprise, relying by doing it on B doing their part in the same enterprise. So a lot of people have described trust as essential to collaboration. Its role is within collaboration, and I'm not going to agree with that. So some examples. In football, a successful pass may depend on the activity of two people, the person kicking the ball and the person running into space to receive the ball. So a pass is a collaboration. If one player runs into space as part of that collaboration, trusting the other to kick the ball through the channel, they're trusting their teammate to be doing that. At the same time, the, the player kicking the ball is trusting their teammate to be making the run behind the defense. So consider another example, getting vaccinated. When I get the jab, I trust the medical experts to be supplying something safe and effective. The collaborative enterprise we're both engaged in is the vaccination program. In doing my part, I'm relying on them to be doing their part. It's not quite true that they're also relying on me to be doing my part, though they are relying on enough of us to be doing their part. So we might say that the medical experts are trusting the public at large to do their part in the vaccination program. So you've always got these two parties in trust. Both of them are doing stuff. And both of the things they're doing belong to the same enterprise. That's the, essentially the framework that I'm giving. And the key thing is that the trusting person is relying on the other person to be doing their part in that collaboration. Now, I think that this simple idea that trust involves reliance within collaborations is sufficient to generate some interesting analysis of the ethical responsibilities to trust. The first question that it raises in this context is what sort of collaborative enterprises might generate ethical responsibilities? And I'll start with one that's of the most direct interest in the Peritia project, the collaborative enterprise of knowledge transfer. I will argue that the ethical responsibilities generated by this enterprise alone are quite thin, but become more interesting when we see knowledge transfer within other more rich ethical contexts. So knowledge transfer is a collaborative enterprise involving someone who knows and someone who learns. They're both essential to the process. You can't do it with only one of those people. The part of the expert, or the knower, is to communicate truly and helpfully, and the part of the learner is to understand and accept this. Ethical responsibility for the receiver of the knowledge will only enter into this picture to the extent that the individual has the ethical responsibility to know. While knowledge may be an end in itself, there's no ethical responsibility to know, to know everything. It's no failing of mine not to be interested in knowing which teams have won the Men's World Football Cup over the last 60 years. And so the ethical issue of trust or distrust does not arise for me if some pedant in the pub is telling me the list of winners. It doesn't matter whether I trust him or not, him or her, I should say, or not. On the other hand, I should know the names of the streets in my town if I'm presenting myself as a taxi driver. As an academic, I should know the regulations that govern my activities. And I should know something of the stuff I'm teaching. Perhaps we all have an ethical responsibility to know what's going on in the world, to the extent that we're all potentially engaged in these activities. So the ethical responsibility to know things within some realm 
depends on one's social role with respect to that realm. And when you do have an ethical responsibility to know something which you can't work out for yourself, then you have a corresponding responsibility to engage in a collaborative exercise with, uh, of knowledge transfer, a collaborative exercise with the people who do know. What this means is you have an ethical responsibility to trust or distrust appropriately. You should accept what the trustworthy person tells you and not what the untrustworthy person tells you. And this should is an ethical should if you don't take enough care to establish whom to trust when it's a matter of having an ethical responsibility to know, then that lack of care is an ethically reprehensible negligence. The prime minister who's imposing a new set of rules on the citizens of a country concerning the banning of parties during a pandemic is under an ethical obligation to know what those rules are. And if he or she trusts the word of a senior civil servant who says it'll be fine to have lots of drink and in your garden, karaoke and party games until two in the morning because it's in one's place of work, then that trust might be seen to be ethically negligent. But as I suggested earlier, this sort of ethical responsibility to trust or distrust is actually quite limited. And that's because there's something a bit strained about taking the acquisition of knowledge to be an ethical requirement. So I want to move on to other collaborative enterprises where the ethical issues might be more clear and in doing so, in a way, I'm moving away from quite a lot of the focus of the Peretia project because a lot of the conversation is about knowledge transfer, as if that was really the only context for trust. But in Baker's example, the relevant collaborative enterprise is not only knowledge transfer. The friend of a purported spy is not under an ethical obligation to know whether she's really a spy. She would be if she were a government agent whose job was to root out spies in the service. But in this case, the relevant collaborative enterprise is that of sustaining a relationship. It takes two to have a friendship, and each party has to be active in various respects to establish and maintain the friendship. Having a friendship involves treating your friend in some respects differently from the way you treat others. And this difference is in part a normative difference. On the one hand, friendship may involve enjoying things together and being on the same wavelength in certain sorts of conversation. But actually, these are things that connect me to this complete stranger sitting next to me in a football game. What characterizes a friendship is also that you look out for one another, that you're there for each other in some respect, that you have some concern for them. And this involves something like a commitment. The precise nature of this commitment will vary from friendship to friendship. If your friend fails to be there for you in the relevant respect, then they've let you down. And this, because, this is because in making your own commitment to the friendship, you're relying on them to do the same. The joint enterprise of having a friendship and maintaining a friendship requires something from both parties. Now, it might be objected that friendship isn't about morality, but about feelings. What you should do as a friend is determined not by duty, but by love. The great thing about friendship is that it's easy and natural and doesn't make you do things you don't want to do. But I think this is to raise a false dichotomy. Of course, friendship is based on feeling, but this doesn't stop it meaning that there are things you should and shouldn't do as a friend. The joint enterprise may rely on little more than not doing certain things that one would naturally do to people outside of the relationship. If I'm particularly sensitive to not revealing something of myself to non-friends, and some non-friend is responsible for revealing it to the wider world, this isn't a breach of trust, but merely a humiliation to me. But if my friend does it, then their failure to live up to the joint commitment of the relationship undermines that relationship, which I've been maintaining by satisfying my side of the deal. So returning to Baker's example, she claims that to a certain extent, accepting what my friend tells me is something I should do as part of the friendship. Now, why should this be? Well, I think it's to do with the fact that being there for my friend involves adopting their point of view, being sympathetic and being in a place to talk to them about their situation. So when the friend says, trust me, it's important that you trust me. Why is it important? Well, it's important because it enables you and the friend to be in some kind of connection in that relationship. Imagine what would happen to a friendship um, if you didn't do these things. So here's an imaginary dialogue. Friend says, it's terrible being falsely accused of being a spy. And you say, well, in fact, given that you are a spy, it's all you deserve. 
Now, there's something you might just think, as a friend, you're giving them tough love in that con- in that in that context. But depending on what sort of friendship it is, that's probably the end of the friendship. Even though I may keep the friendship going on the surface by faking it and only pretending to accept what my friend is saying, it has at that point become a false friendship, a sort of imitation of a friendship. Now, of course, there might be a context in which, as a good friend, you should persuade the person not to be lying to the public about their status as a spy. But if the friend is just saying to you, I'm not a spy, you've got to trust me, um, at that point, you really don't have that option. The tough love option isn't on, on the table. And is an aspect of genuine friendship requires belief, as Baker insists. If so, it would seem that belief is sensitive to practical considerations, which seems wrong. But we don't actually need to answer that question here. I'll just limit my discussion to talking about accepting what someone says, whatever that amounts to. Very much like the collaborative enterprise of knowledge transfer, sometimes friendship requires one person to be telling the truth and the other person to be accepting what they're being told. The goal in this case isn't knowledge as such, but the basis for a sympathetic relationship, one in which the friends can be there for each other. If my friend has lied to me, then she's not done her part in that collaborative enterprise. Being lied to in such a significant respect undermines any chance of a genuinely sympathetic relationship. And likewise, if I don't accept what she tells me, I've not done my part. By accepting what she says, I'm relying on her doing her part. I'm trusting her. Indeed, by her telling me that she's not a spy, she's relying on my accepting what she says, and she is trusting me. So if my friend does lie to me, then she's betraying my trust in her as a friend. And if I don't accept what she says, then I'm betraying her trust in me as a friend. So I think Baker is correct to say that you may have responsibility to accept what your friend says, even when the evidence doesn't support this, assuming, that is, that your friendship is a good thing in itself. Baker claims there's something special about friendships, where these considerations wouldn't apply in other relationships, but I'm not sure this is correct. Consider the relationship you have with a complete stranger when you ask them what the time is. Suppose you're due to meet someone at a certain place, you're not sure you're, you've got the right time, they're not there. You ask a stranger, do you have the time? Uh, they go to the trouble of checking, they look at their watch, they say, yes, the time is this. Um, and at this point, you um, say, so, okay, thank you. And then you ask somebody else. Now, the first person you've asked is going to feel, in some way, betrayed by that behavior of yours. Why is that? Well, because in stopping what they were doing and going to the trouble to check and answer the question, they were in entering into a relationship with you, a collaboration. And the collaboration in this case isn't just knowledge transfer. If it were just knowledge transfer, the other person would be absolutely fine about you then going on to ask somebody else and several other people. But in this case, the enterprise is embedded in another collaboration, the enterprise of maintain, maintaining a very short-term social relationship. So all, all the time, walking down the street, we're engaging these relationships with people who are complete strangers. Consider the example of political supporters. In aligning yourself with a political party or a political figure, you're engaging in a collaborative enterprise of getting that party into power or keeping it there. The party leaders have a role in determining good policies and valid lines of argument. And your role as a supporter is to promulgate these ideas and to assert and defend them. To do this, you have to trust the party leaders to be doing their part in determining actually good practices and actually valid lines of argument. You must accept these things in order to support them. And again, your responsibility to trust the political leaders you support and to accept what they say doesn't depend on the evidence alone, but it depends on your role in a collaborative enterprise that you're committed to. It's easy to criticize people for blindly following leaders. But I'm arguing that we ha may have an ethical responsibility to be a little bit blind in following leaders. And the people we criticize have simply got the balance wrong. They should have given up on the collaborative enterprise of supporting that leader in the face of the evidence that the leader was untrustworthy. Something similar happens with religious faith. Religious practices are usually social practices involving a collaboration with religious authorities. Their role is to lead you in the practice, to teach you how to think and what to do, Yours is to think and do what you're supposed to be doing within these practices. You're relying on them to lead you well, and they're relying on you to be led. If there's some merit in the practice, then it's right for you to rely on the religious authorities. In all these cases, and this is my final paragraph, there's an ethical question about whether the collaborative enterprise in question is a valuable one. Assuming it is, 
then in engaging with it, part of your role is to trust others within it. In cases like the ones I've been considering, trusting the others in this collaboration involves accepting what they're saying, even when the evidence doesn't support this. In each of these cases, there may come a moment when the evidence is so clearly against what you're being told that you should no longer accept it. But this is always a sort of betrayal of the practice you are committed to. You will feel that you're letting down the people you no longer trust. Ethically, of course, you may fall back on the thought that it's those people who've betrayed you by lying to you. But unless you know for certain that they've lied to you, your failure to trust them will have the sense that it may be you doing the betraying. That's why we talk of the sin of apostasy in losing trust with religious authorities, or treachery when you change sides in political or military disputes. Sticking by your friends, allies and leaders beyond the point that the evidence strictly demands, but not to the point that the evidence forbids, may be an ethical requirement. There's always a space for discretion when considering whether to accept what you're being told, where the evidence doesn't require you to go one way or the other. In this space, if you have an ethical responsibility to engage in the practice of friendship, political support or religious engagement in the first place, then you have an ethical responsibility to trust beyond the point that the evidence requires. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren, for a very insightful answer.